My sister Molly was just 20 years old when she died from melanoma. She had a small mole on the back of her leg that was left unchecked. Regardless of your skin tone, if you have a mole that changes shape or color, see a dermatologist right away. Download this free app today to learn about mole identification and how to stay skin cancer safe. Skin cancer is preventable, and melanoma, if caught early, can be cured. A tiny 5% of the people in the world consume one-third of its resources and produce almost half the non-organic waste. Those people are us. Nothing is destroying this planet faster than the way we North Americans live. Hi, I'm Paula Marinoni, and you're watching Fayetteville Public Access Television. People around town have been asking me the same question and they have been asking me why did I cut my hair well do you want to know why I cut my hair I'll tell you why I cut my hair I'll tell you why I cut my hair I'll tell you why I cut my hair you see the community <laughs> when you turn it on there you go. Whether you come in the doors or you just turn on TV, you see the community. You see parts of the community that you never knew existed. Public access is, is media for the public. It's media for the community. We wouldn't be community access television without the community. Hey, we would just be access television. We'd be at instead of cat. I think that TV shouldn't be passive entertainment. It should be interactive, you know. It's supposed to be uh, a way that you can participate in your community. The First Amendment is kind of like a muscle. If you sit around all day and don't use it, it's going to start to atrophy. You need to be kicking the hell out of that muscle constantly, really pushing against it so that it'll be strong when you need it. Hi, we just saw a clip from a documentary called The Open Channel, Public Access and the People Next Door. And with us today is Nikita Reed, a documentary filmmaker. <laughs> so, uh, Nikita, it's nice to have you on the show. Thank you. Thanks so, for having me. So what, what inspired you to make a documentary about public access, of all things? Well... I say of all things. I mean, I, I appreciate public access, but a lot of people mm -hmm. uh, don't. So what inspired you to do that? Well, I was just surprised that a resource like this was available in the community. Um, for so cheap. Um, I attend the University of Arkansas and I never took a videography class. So I was looking around in the city for places where I could just take quick lessons because I was getting ready to shoot my very first student film at the university and I found Cat. And they say, hey, you could just spend $25 and we'll teach you all this cool stuff. And I was like, are you serious? So um, I was looking at the library and I heard some of the history and seemed like a no-brainer. This had to be documented. So, now, what were you majoring in the university? Journalism. Now, you were pretty close to the end of your degree, weren't you? Yes. Yes, I was almost done. Um, I just had to pick a thesis topic, and I was out of there. But um, it was just something about documentary filmmaking that I found really interesting. And I said, what the heck, let's do another year. And so here I am, <laughs> a year later. So once you discovered CAT itself, what was it like when you came down here? It was very open, um, and I like that. Uh, I do like structure, but I do like to be able to, I would like to be able to be creative. Yeah. You know, I don't want to be con placed in constraint. And so here at the CAT, I really like that you could check out a camera and they didn't care what you shot. You yeah. know, I know some people were shooting five minute music videos about 
dogs or, you know, or amateur horror movie, whatever they wanted right. to do. And I thought that was just really, really cool. So I just like that freedom and I could just take the camera out. I could play with it and you can't get a bad grade or a good grade. You just do your thing. So, so how would you rate the training you got? I'm sorry? How would you rate the training you got down here? Um. It was cool. Um, it was very hands-on. You know, it was no textbook. I couldn't go out and just say, hey, right. I want a textbook on how to do white balance. You actually have to do white right. balance. You know, you have to actually check for audio. It's very hands-on. And I mean, if you mess up. And that's something it's easy, <laughs> it's easy to mess up on, too. Yeah, it is. But once you mess up a couple of times, you know, you know what, I need better check this yeah. before I actually. So you actually learn quicker that way. So, you know, if you don't understand something, the people here are open on actually yeah. showing you what to do, you know, you don't feel like a dummy or anything like that, so. Right. Cool. What was the documentary class like at the university? Um, I, I, it was a big learning experience. I didn't know the formal structure of yeah. writing a script, you know, yeah. writing a proposal and an outline. Um, but I was kind of like placed in a, a position of the writer. Yeah. Um, down here at the CAD, if I wanted to produce something, I was the writer, I was the director, I was the producer, you know, I was right. all these things. So. It wasn't just, okay, you're going to be this person in the group and that's it. I kind of had to get a feel for everything if right. I was going to put together a show. So, so when, was it a daunting task for you when you started to put it together? It was. Uh, <laughs> I often joke that um, I had a little too much access. I was yeah. gonna, you know, most people, when you start a documentary, you're concerned about not having access at all. Yeah. Um, but here I had people saying, oh, I got all these tapes, you know, but it's just me on this project. So right. I had to take into account, I can't go through thousands of hours right. and Cat has thousands of hours, right. you know. So, um, and I think that's where the documentary class came into place because I was able to actually focus on a story and stick to it. Right. And I know who was in my story. So I could go to them and say, hey, I want a few of these tapes, right. you know, but it was still a lot of stuff and people were really, really open. The access was just incredible, but like I said, I do know <laughs> it's probably better to have too much access than too little, but right. after a while, it, it can be kind of overwhelming. So what was it like when you started to interview people for the project? Um, well, I was already a reporter. I, I went into school right. for print journalism. so. I think it kind of enhanced my interview skills because, you know, it wasn't just me writing incessantly on a, on a pad. You know, I actually had to look at people. I had to, you know, nod. I had to engage them instead right. of just reading all questions on a piece of paper. You know, I had to increase my listening skills, you know, so I could make sure I, you know, didn't forget to ask something, you know. Right. And, you know, after a while, it did start to become a conversation. I was asking things I was genuinely, genuinely concerned about. So... Yeah. When you talk to one person, would that lead you to uh, ask more questions of someone mm -hmm. else? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I found out a lot of stories that initially I didn't know about. So I might have been asking about one thing and might have led to another thing, you know, and I was able to use that in the documentary, things I hadn't even thought about, yeah. you know, so. What sort of things might, might that be? Um, I know I interviewed Duncan Skiles, and I know um, initially you're saying, you know, I just came down here with friends, you know, but seeing how one of his friends just asked him to come down to the cat with him. Right. And now he's a film director. Right. You know, he went to NYU, yeah. you know, just because he was here playing around with some cameras yeah. at cat. And it's like, that's incredible. You know, just the, the, the potential, you know, access gives to people. So. Do, you, do you find, while you're making your documentary, mm -hmm. that there are people who have sort of a, um, they sort of look down their noses at the whole process mm -hmm. of public access or the, the whole concept of public access for the people who use it. Yeah, and when I when I tell people, or the told people that I was shooting a documentary at CAT, yeah, I got some people like, oh, that place, oh boy, or, you know, or either like, <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, it might have been like, oh, well, you know, who are those crazy people anyway, you know what I'm saying? Or yeah. they just think it's just a whole bunch of people just, you know, doing all these wild and crazy things, but... As I was here, I saw a lot of different people using the equipment. And it's like, if people could just come here and see their neighbors. And that's why I say, you know, the title of my film is Public Access, not Public Access Television and the People Next Door. Do you really know your neighbors? Right. Because I've seen a group of what, from middle age to teenage to elder, they were in here singing one right. time. You know, I've seen farmers, I've seen artists. So for people to try to, try to typecast producers here at CAT, you know, it's actually your neighbors who are participating. Why aren't you down here? You know, and I, I got that a lot too. You know, what is that stigma? And I, I got that a lot from some of the stories I heard through my interviews too. 
that they might have seen something, they might have heard about something in the news, and all of a sudden that's all of CAD, and that just wasn't true. The show is kind of bent, kind of countercultural, uh, kind of skewed. It's like punk rock put the video without the music. That's the best way I can explain it. One thing my ex-roommate and my co-producer wanted to do for a long time was do stuff with a pig head. They used to carry them a lot in local, local supermarkets and let's get a pig head and use it for a prop. This is part of a weekly show that aired Saturday at midnight on Fayetteville's Public Access Channel 8. It's a show that's bringing complaints from animal rights advocates and others. What I love about this story is that uh, the Lemur brothers um, were kind enough or, or thoughtful enough to put it on after 11 or midnight. But because it became a story on Monday, uh, KFSM used the same footage at 5, 6, and 10. <laughs> <laughs> Both men admit they went a little too far in this show and they say that it won't happen again. But the incident raises questions about the screening process at the cable access television station. And a lot of times, I guess, you know, you, you saw this in your research, that it's the negative stuff mm -hmm. that just gets blown out of proportion on the news. Right, right. And it's sad because um, when I was talking to people like Catherine Sherrills, who's a professor at the journalism department, right. she was a manager back in, you know, the 1980s here. Back when it was fit, open yeah. yeah. She has this plethora of video footage of people in the community, and it's historical. You know, this is the people in Fayetteville back in the day, and I thought that was kind of cool. You could actually see your uncle when he was 20, and he's pretending to do a wrestling match just for a heck of it. You know what I'm saying? Right. You could see your aunt and she's talking about, you know, some water system, you know, that needs, you know, and then from there to then you get right. to see the outcome. You know, it's all of this historical information. It's not even saved at the library. Right. It's like, wow, you know, it's sad, you know. I know. It's just that that wealth of information that Faith was just missing out on. In fact, it, the whole library is what is like 10 feet away from us. <laughs> yeah, but literally. Beyond that wall right there, yeah. <laughs> right, and I mean, who knows? What's out there? I know you guys have done calls for, you know, lost favor open channel tapes, but right. I mean, Catherine Sherrill's came out of her own personal library with a good 20. Yeah. You know, and I had to say, okay, look, I can only take about five or 10, right. but just on those tapes, just on those few little clips, you get to see a snapshot of what Fayetteville was like, and that's priceless. Right. And there are literally hundreds of tapes that yes. were missing from the old Fayetteville yes. channel library. Yeah, so who knows where they are? I, mean, I, know, I know where some of them are. Uh, <laughs> where, some of them, where some of them went, that's a sad story. But um, so once you started looking at the tapes, mm -hmm. um, did you have to watch the entire tape or were you just, just sort of skimming through looking for pieces? or? Yeah, it depended on um, how well the record was kept. Yeah. I know Cheryl's had, um, she had notes. So I was yeah. able to say, okay, on this tape is going to be the Sap Sisters and, you know, um, Fayetteville Live. You know, but for Duncan, you know, it was just episode. He might have like snippets about what's on there, right. but of course, I had to look through and see actually, you know. And I couldn't just say, okay, I'm just going to look at the middle and that's it, because you right. might miss a, a gem, you right. know. So there were some that I had to say, okay, I'm just going to skim through and maybe something will catch my eye. But you know, it's a risk because it's like, oh man, you could have got something really wonderful, yeah. you know. So. And of course, some people you weren't able to interview on camera, but you 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 interviewed them mm -hmm. uh, like. Bob, Mary, uh, McKinney Bob McKinney and, and uh, Mary, Mary Orton. Orton yeah. Um, yeah, and she told me a lot of stuff about the history um, of public access here in Fayetteville, and she had a couple tapes too. Now, her tapes were really, really old school, so I had to be careful. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, um, even though she wasn't on camera, she did provide a lot of information. You, you, you actually, in your production notes, you refer to uh, the community producers as pseudo minorities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because of that stigma, you know, um, and it is kind of like a small group that, I mean, I know it is like a different people every week, but right. it is still like a minority of people who actually use the facilities and they are ostracized in the community, you know, even though the people who use them are just the people who live in Fayetteville, right. you know, I mean, just like a black person, it's just a, a regular person that lives in society, it right. just happens to be black, you know, so, you know, I kind of... I kind of simulated that experience in my experience because that's how I felt sometimes, you know, being ostracized, but it's like you're just a regular person, you right. know. 
So actually, it's, it's sort of true. It's like um, it's one thing about the producers is that uh, it's like it, it covers a whole wide variety, the whole diversity of Fayetteville. It's mm -hmm. like everybody's represented. Right, and and I think I wrote that too because I felt like this double consciousness kind yeah. of. Whereas um, on a racial level, it'd be yeah. like, you know, a black world and a white world. But right. here, it was kind of like um, I was in a formal university structure and I was a cat producer. So I was right. able to see both sides. You know, I kind of saw the benefits of university education. Right. And then I saw the benefits of being a producer, you know. And just seeing both of those sides, I was able to see the faults in both of them were the, you know, the downfall. Yeah. So it was kind of like, you know. This, it was kind of weird. It's like, oh, I'm a producer, but at the same time, I'm observing, right. you know, what a producer is, even though yeah. I am one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I produced this film with the skills I learned here. Right. So I, this is a product of CAT. Right. So in essence, this film produced itself. Yeah. So <laughs> how much footage do you, do you think you actually ended up with? I got about 20 tapes, and they're all about 45 minutes long. Some are 30. So, I don't know, probably about <laughs> 18 hours, okay. probably. Yeah. I mean, it's, it was, you know, not counting the videos that I got from Fayetteville Open Channel and access for Fayetteville. I had to go out and buy a, an external hard drive. Oh, wow, okay. And it was 500 gigabytes? Yeah. Guess how many gigabytes I got left? I'm afraid to ask. How many? 100. Really? Yes. Wow, okay. And that's just from footage I collected from people, from producers saying this is some of the work I've done. Yeah. Just them. Can you imagine people who came in randomly, you know, who knows what's out there. It's just yeah. amazing. Um, so how hard was it to, for you to start making the cuts to, to what to include and what not to include? Oh, as a, a fellow writer, yeah. you know the term killing right. your darlings. Yeah. And I really didn't want to cut. At first, like I said, I started out around an hour. Right. Um, but for the university, it has to be 26 minutes and 46 seconds. Really? Okay. So yeah. <laughs> I had the task of trying to include a history of public access in Fayetteville. Yeah. And talk about the producer experience and talk about the future of CAT, you know, and yeah. some of the challenges. All in 26 minutes, so it was kind of like there were some really good gems of videos from shows that producers have produced, you know, and there was really important information that I had to get in. It was just like, how am I going to do this? But after a while, I think that actually enhanced my editing skills right. because I had to really catch the essence of something in a brief moment, you know, so I think it just heightened my skills, but I really wish I would have had like an extra 30 minutes. It would have been... So, awesome to have. So when you have the interviews, are just going to be like brief snippets from the interviews on there? Or? Yes, yes. I'll have snippets. It'll be followed up with actual shows, you know, that the producer um, was engaged in or um, as they're talking about the subject. I'll, I had so many videos, I could just kind of put it over um, as the speaker is talking, like a voiceover. So a big challenge with community access television is you get someone who is um, a high authority in the community, has a lot of clout, carries a lot of weight, even I, I know that past board members and people who have governed the organization have said, I don't like that show, take it off the air. And when the staff does that, it sets the ground for a potential lawsuit for a city government because the funding for this organization comes from the city government out of uh, you know their general funds. So, uh, if we pull a program off the air, that's a state action, and that's censorship. The only limit on cable is the same limit that's on the internet or in print or anywhere else on stage, and that is that it has to be legally obscene in order for the government to ban it. If you read Arkansas state law about what is legally obscene, you would be embarrassed to read it on TV. I mean. Uh, it's all the ACOs that you can imagine, you know, um, and, and legal obscenity is just uh, way, way out there. We're, I mean, we're talking bestiality and necrophilia and things that, that you're not going to get at Blockbuster. Because it's cable, the law says you're in control. Number one, you don't have to have cable. We're going to try to watch what's on broadcast stations. But on cable stations, maybe it's yours. You know, you ask for it, you get it. If today all the cameras were to break down, 
we would not be in a very good place because we don't have the money to replace those things. So money is is definitely a constant struggle. Content I don't think is um, because we're, there's always somebody in the community that is going to want to make a television show. There's always going to be that. We're, I don't think we will ever have a problem getting people to come in. We're like the last of the Knights Templar. We are imperfect beings defending the perfect ideal. Um. How, how much of Nikita Reed is on the, on the uh, documentary? <laughs> how much of me? I don't know. I, that's a tough question. I don't think any of I mean, I, I share the experience of the producers. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I try to keep myself out of it yeah. so I could be objective. So the part of me that's in it would probably be the advocacy right. for Kat. Um, but since I am a journalist, I have to say, you know what, these are their appearances, their experiences, so it's that double consciousness thing, you know, it's like I'm a part of it, but I can't be a part of it, you right. know, so. What if know. anything surprised you when you were making the documentary? I think the honesty of people, yeah. and I open, I had to be prepared for that because it is public access. Right. You can't be censored. And I know I might have run into people here at the station who back in the day might have had some pretty harsh views. Right. You know, they might have had some racial views. They might have had some, you know, sexist views. But I can't judge them, you right. know, because this is their right. You know, me and Catherine Sherrills were talking about this. I think um, there has been cases that come up with the Ku Klux Klan have tried to air programs across the station um, that are pretty darn racist, you know, but yes. they can't stop them from airing it. Exactly. And you know what? Yeah, they want to have that opinion. Cool. As long as they don't touch me, you know. Right. But like I said, I had to mentally prepare myself for what I was going to see. And I can't hold it against people because that's their view. So um, luckily, none of that came up. <laughs> um, I think I was more shocked at how creative people were. I was shocked at how good amateur video looked, you know, and how the possibilities are endless, you know, without that commercial barrier placed on people in their programming. Why do you think there's such a snobbish view? <laughs> And it is snobbish, to be sure. Why do you think there's such a snobbish view about the, the so-called amateur video? Well, I think people like that get nervous, you know? Um, it's like, how dare you? It's like the bloggers and the journalists. I could say that. I could say I'm a snob towards bloggers. I'm like, well, you're not really a journalist. Well, why not, right. you know? Um, with them, the snobbish people, it's like, you know, they put all that time and energy into producing stuff. They've done this and they've done that for this person, and then you could just pick up a camera and, you know, who are you? Who do you think you are? I think that's where the snobbery comes from. You know, it's like, who do you think you are where you could just pick up a camera and think that you could just go with it and produce something of quality that's not supposed to happen. There's supposed to be seniority. There's supposed to be status levels, you know. But A pecking order. Yeah, yeah. And pecking I think order. that, you know, they think that they're the only ones that can produce, and that's just not true. Yeah. So I saw a documentary a few weeks ago. Okay. Um, after uh, the anniversary of 9-11 called mm -hmm. 102 Minutes That Changed the World. Okay. And uh, it was all entirely amateur video. Wow. Uh, none of it was professional video. It was all amateur video collected from people who was shot on September 11th. And I think it was amazing watching the immediacy of the amateur video mm -hmm. as opposed to the professional video. Mm -hmm. And I think I was a lot more impressed with that than I was with a lot of the professional video that was shot that mm -hmm. day. Yeah, and like I said, it's becoming a more, I don't want to say epidemic, it's not like a bad thing, but it's becoming more prevalent, you know, yeah. and it's more honest, you know, it's more truthful, you know, people are actually not having to wait on the journalists to come out, they can say, you know what, this is what's going on with me, let me tell the world, you know, let me show the world what's going on so we can take action, you know, and it kind of does help right. push people to action, and I applaud it, you know, right. but like I said, people think that they're the professionals, they're the only ones that can do it, there's a danger in that because yeah. you're saying what can and can't be produced, what we should be thinking, right. you know, and you can't do that with me. Well, you can, but right. I don't think it's ethical. <laughs> and, 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 and to be honest, people have real skills down here, too. Right, right. And who's to say that you can't get better? Who's to say that, you you know, just because it does look crappy, maybe I want it to look crappy. You know, right. maybe I do want green people in the background and right. screeching and static, you know? Right, it's, it's like... <laughs> Your production looks exactly as you want to look exactly. like. Exactly. You know, and I, before I started this project, I watched a tape um, that Catherine Sky Blakelock, uh, the former manager, former manager yeah. she gave me a tape to look at, um, and it was produced through, I believe, um, Denver Open Media. Yeah. And I saw a clip of a little black girl skipping rope on a video, and they were talking about how 
her being able to do that on TV, show that on TV, it kind of, it's kind of like your rights, you know what I'm saying? People don't have to feel disenfranchised. Right. They don't have to feel like they don't see themselves on TV. And that really stuck a chord with me because it's like, it is true, you know? Instead of me complaining about UPN or CW or whatever it is, not showing black shows, I can produce my own damn show. That's you right. know, I don't have That's to right. wait on you, you know? We have writers, we have people, you know? Why do we have to wait or get somebody's consent to make what we want, you know, and we joke about it all the time. Me and my friends, like um, the McDonald's commercials. Right. We are so sick and tired of every black person. It doesn't matter if they're in a suit about to go to work. They got to be singing or rapping if they're eating something, or you know, who are in these focus groups? You know, what I'm saying. Know. <laughs> so whoever that started in the seventies. That started in the seventies. Really? Yeah. You know, I mean. They're telling us who we need to be, you yeah. know what I'm saying? And it's like, I always wonder who's in the focus group because it's like, no black person in their right mind is gonna think that this is just, this speaks to me, you know, and maybe it speaks to them, but it's like, this isn't all of black America, you yeah. know? So it's just the same thing, you know? When you have those types of barriers, you're not able to feel that control right. in what you're seeing, so. I think, it's, I think it's a threat to a lot of people, mm -hmm. so-called professional people. Uh, once, you st once you start the footage, once mm -hmm. you start working with your, with your documentary, uh, how long did it take you? I, know you? I know you were, it took you a lot longer than you thought it would yeah. take Yeah, man, I started, I actually had, well, I originally started an idea to do a documentary on um, two black-owned restaurants here in Fayetteville. Right, yeah. Um, but I changed it because I just didn't have access to those women. I thought, oh, I'm oh, a okay. black girl, you know, I'll be able to get, you know, access. It's just not true, you yeah. know. Um, but I, I actually switched it to the cat because I did think that it was um, it was needed, you yeah. know. So I started that in like July, right? July or August yeah. of 2009, and then from there I've just been hitting it, you know. And I thought I was going to be done in March or April of 2010. But I got a job in Memphis, so right. I said I can commute. Yeah. I had a car accident uh, commuting back and forth. I mean, um, and of course, professors go on vacation over right. the summer, and so now I'm just like, you know what? I'm gonna finish <laughs> regardless. So I mean, right. yeah, I would have been done with my degree probably September 2008. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and now it's just been extended to you know a couple of years, and I'm okay with that. It's cool. So do you have the finished product though? Mm-hmm. Actually done. Right, right. Um, I am gonna change the ending and I'm hoping maybe I could do like an extended cut. Um, because I know there's a lot of things I had to cut out. The director's cut. Yeah, the director's <laughs> cut, exactly. So um there may be an hour long edition <laughs> that'll be coming to Cat's Way soon. So that's good. That's great. It's a lot mm -hmm. of people I think would be interested because no one's actually ever done that done a documentary on the history of all this before. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been little snippets about, uh, there was a documentary years ago, the Fayetteville Open Channel, the mm -hmm. first 10 years, and a documentary on the Access Wars in the early 90s. Okay. There's not many, nobody's really tackled a project as big as yours before. Right, and I came at this as like an introduction right. to public access per se. I know um, some people are concerned that a lot of stuff didn't make it into the film, but I really, the type of people I want to watch this film are the ones that say, oh, those weirdos, or the people who don't necessarily understand the whole concept of public access. Th those, are, th those are people who wouldn't want the weirdos to even have 10 seconds. <laughs> you know? Right, right. Right. But you know, a lot of people, when they start labeling people, it's kind of like, they don't want the weirdos yeah, to yeah, find out stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, once, once they start labeling people, I mean, mm -hmm. they've got their minds closed to start with. Right, exactly, exactly, because you don't fit into this is you're not a box. Wine, you're, not a wine, <laughs> you're not a wine and cheeser. There's, um, there's always going to be people upset, though, if they don't make the cut, or mm -hmm. if not everything they say is is in the documentary. Right. But I'm assuming, though, that, that everything that I said is going to be in there, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you're in there quite a bit, so, yeah, you should be satisfied, I hope. <laughs> oh, no. I, I, I know about the editing process, you know. Uh, but um, I think it's just grand that you've done this because mm -hmm. it's it's it's. I think it's going to be very exciting, and I think mm -hmm. it's going to be very exciting uh, when people in Fayetteville see this. Right. Yeah. And like I said, I'm hoping to come back and screen it. And like I said, I do hope people who haven't been to the station before, or who haven't been in a while, or have this jacked up idea about it, actually do see it, or they see a clip. You know, when they're sitting at home and. You know, they see some of the rich stuff that, you know, people have done. They see some of the recitals 
their friends have put on TV. You know, some of the other stuff, there's so many different shows. You can't really just label Cat because it's just Maybe it's everybody. A, maybe you give a copy <laughs> to everybody on the city council. <laughs> Say it's produced in the university. Maybe they'll watch yeah. it. <laughs> uh, so what part, what, what kind of te technical difficulties did you have? Man, okay. Yeah, I'm not the greatest uh, <laughs> camera person, but I... I I, I never used a light kit. Yeah. I didn't use one the whole entire production. Um, so I might have had lighting issues. I, there's a point where you have to white balance. So right. your people don't look orange or blue. Right. I messed up a couple times on that. <laughs> um, audio was just a big issue because I, those cameras look scary. You know, yeah. they have all these little knobs and buttons. So, you know, those knobs and buttons mean things, you know. But yes. I, I mean, the audio would probably be super loud and I ignored it. Or like, oh, I could fix it later. Right. Or maybe one speaker was out. Yeah. Or maybe I didn't record sound at all. You know, so yeah. I just had people in the studio like. <laughs> so you, so, so you have to, come back, you have yeah. to come back and record them again? Yeah. You know, and I think um, with Catherine Sherrill's, I had to record her interview twice. Because I recorded in the f wrong format. Oh. But, I mean, I'm kind of glad I went through all that. Because it shows that if I can shoot a documentary, you know, and really just put my heart into it yeah. and commit to learning it and learn from my mistakes, anybody can do it, you that's know? Right. So, I mean, I'm glad I made those mistakes. I'm not going to make them that's again. Right. That's, right. That's, right. that's why God put erasers on the pencils. Right, exactly. So, I mean, you know, we got to get out there. You got to get a little dusty. You got to look like a dunce, you know, yeah. to actually do something. You know, it's okay. I survived. I'm getting a degree. Yeah. <laughs> no blood was shed. Yeah, I, I think people would just be really thrilled when they see it. I hope so. Uh, <laughs> I hope people look at it. <laughs> so, so when when will the people at the university actually see? Have they seen it yet? Um, my professors have. Yeah. Um, if I do a screening, I probably put up some flyers and invite yeah. people down to the station. If I do screen it anywhere, I wanted to have it here okay. in the studio, um, so people can actually come down, look at the station, look at how it's evolving. Because you guys have got a lot of new stuff in here, yeah. you know, and you guys offer a lot of different things yeah. as far as outreach. So. Right. And your, your, your production costs, you said your production expenses never exceeded, what, $250? It probably would have been lower than that um, if I didn't have to buy the external hard drive because I had so much material. But, I mean, other than buying, like, tapes, you get a three-pack for, like, 10 or you buy them in bulk and save a lot of money. Right. Um, gas, you know, I didn't even count that. But, I mean, if you live right here in Fayetteville, I mean, you could do a movie for free, practically. So, you know. do you use, you use a Mac or a... Yes, I had an okay. iMac that I bought a couple years earlier. Um, so, like, I was fortunate I had the equipment already, but Cat has cameras. They have computers, you know. It's really no excuse, you know, if you really want to do something. Right, and, you, and, and, and I guess so. You and you bought Final Cut Pro for your mm -hmm. Mac, for your and Mac. I was a student, so it cost me what twenty dollars or yeah. something like that. Maybe been, been even cheaper. So good. So yeah. I just see. I just bought an iMac, so I need to buy. Final Cut Pro, so. <laughs> and iMacs have iMovie, so I didn't even right. really have to get Final Cut if I didn't want. But I was so, used to using it. So <laughs> so, how, so how, what was it like to edit at home? Um, a lot of people tried to interrupt me because, you know, when you're at a computer, Those people bastards. think you're playing. <laughs> yeah. They think you're on Facebook or something. You're yeah, like, no, I'm, I'm making a movie. No, and they're like, you? Yeah. Yeah. A movie? Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. And it's yeah. like, no, seriously, I'm a documentary filmmaker now. You need to leave me alone, you right. know. So it was tough. You know, it's kind of like with writing. You know, you have to tell people your writing time is serious. My editing time is serious. I'm really doing a production and I need... Editing time, people, leave me alone. People don't understand. <laughs> people think you can stop and start if you're doing something creative. Right. You know, you know, come out to the kitchen. You know, no, I'm really doing something here. And the problem is, too, like uh, the external hard drive I had, yeah. if you let, left it idle for a while, yeah. it just went dead. Oh, man. So really? if I left any time, I had to like click to like a, a sequence and have it just playing until I came back because it had to keep running. So it yeah. was... Uh, <laughs> it was a lot of challenges, yeah. but so, so yeah, you have a part in your production notes. I got it's called recognizing passion. Mm -hmm. Was that was that was that like did that come through in the yeah. interviews? Can you can you actually see that on screen? Yeah, um, a lot of people defended Cat a lot, and it's not just something like just a gimmick to get people down here. It's really yeah. like if y'all shut this down, we are gonna riot, you know. Yeah. And I think um, without getting too heavy with the free speech jargon, yeah. you know, I was able to get a sense that people felt like their right as a producer was an extension of their freedom of speech. Yeah. And it is, you know, you can't be censored, you know, you can't be limited on your content, you know. 
And that's a pretty big deal. I was talking with some of my interviewees, you know, during the production process, and I was like, you guys are right next door to a police station. You know, in other countries, you can't even talk about, you know, an official without getting arrested right. or jailed. And you guys are sitting here like, blue whoever, you know, yeah. and you're right next to the police, and they can't do nothing to you. Right. We take that for granted. Yeah. You know, we could come in and check out a $1,000 camera and shoot whatever we want. That's right. We're spoiled. <laughs> you know, and um, that passion, that, 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 that warmth that people feel for Kat, I felt it too, you know, but it did come out on camera, you know, and people, you know, most people might be camera shy, but when it comes to that, it's like, oh man, you know, this is where I'm able to be creative. This yeah. is where I'm able to say my opinion, you know, yeah. so. Yeah. Now, before we go, we, I guess we need to talk about the music you used. Yes, yes. I used um, a solo CD from Jory Costello. Yeah. Her guitar skills are awesome. Um, I used, actually used about three or four songs from her album. Really? Okay. Yeah, so she's really good. And then what Army, I use kind of for like the Abbey of the Lemur. Yeah. Because I felt like that groove was kind of like on the same pace. And then like, you know, for some of their clips of their shows and stuff like that. So now the folks from what Army are also producers yes. at Cat, yeah? Yes, and they've been long time producers too. Yeah. So I was actually glad I was able to use somebody who was actually involved with the station and yeah. use their music and promote them. So, so. yeah, it's good stuff too. Well, I, think, I, well I, I think, and I think the clips we've shown on the show today, mm -hmm. I think should excite people yeah. into watching the whole program. I hope so. So <laughs> I, th I think that, um, I think people would be very happy to see it. I think the mm -hmm. university was very lucky to have you. Thank you. There. And I think that, uh, I think the community is very, very fortunate to have you make this, this production. Well, thank so you. I, I hope, hope people come out to look at it. Well, I, I think you, you need to promote, <laughs> I think that you need to promote it very heavily. I am. <laughs> so anyway, Nikita, I want to thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you. And, uh, uh, we'll see you all next week and uh, mm -hmm. watch as many documentaries as you can. <laughs>
five passengers set sail that day for a three-hour tour. Boom! The weather started getting rough. The tiny ship was tossed. If not for the courage of the fearless crew, the minnow would be lost. The minnow would be lost. The ship's aground on the shore of this uncharted desert isle, with Gilligan, the skipper too, the one percenter, and his wife, the movie star, the man of science, Marianne, here on Gilligan's Island. So here's the story of our castaways. They're here for a long, long time. They'll have to, what? They're still there? Oh, this is stupid. Flint, you told me if I came in this week, I could do Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. That's it, I'm out of here. I'm not doing this, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm leaving, and I'm taking my chair with me. Honor 
This is not a time to falter. This is not a time to fall. This is not a time to give up what you have struggled to create. There is still a power in the earth no man can break. Take courage, be not afraid. This is not a time to falter. This is not a time to fall. This is not a time to give up what you have struggled to create. There is still a power in the earth no man can break. Yes, it is true, there really are people in power who are nothing but schoolyard bullies, stupid and rude. And they're pushing on you, not even for their own gain. No logic can explain, and nobody wins. But they can't hold a candle to you when you stand with your feet. What can you do? The power is not its own and aim higher, my friend, and it'll come true. Because they can't hold a candle to you when you stand. If you think them on the path you love and to power in your hand. To This is not a time to fall. This is not a time to fall. This is not a time to give up what you have struggled to create. There's still a power in the earth. No man can break. Take courage, be not afraid. This is not a time to falter. This is not a time to fall. This is not a time to give up what you have struggled to create. There is still a power in the earth no man can break. Take courage, be not afraid. Take courage, be not afraid. you may or may not know it's really baffling and hard and difficult. And so we have a set of music we call it our abuse set. And this is one of those songs and I know our abuse set it sounds so trite. Um, I'm sorry. Um, this song is a really wonderful song that was written by Fred Small. It is um, about the person who stands, who stays with you. If you've been through abuse as a child or as an adult, there's a piece of you that needs to come back, that needs to be healed. And that piece of you can be very cruel. And to stay with you during that time period can be very difficult. Um, but that constancy is so important. This song is called I Will Stand Fast. And I think all of us, this affects all of us. It's not a small, a small thing. Um, and so we dedicate this to people who have suffered the abuse and the people who um, survived the feeling like that. Um,
Molly was just 20 years old when she died from melanoma. She had a small mole in the back of her leg that was left unchecked. Regardless of your skin tone, if you have a mole that changes shape or color, see a dermatologist right away. Download this free app today to learn about mole identification and how to stay skin cancer safe. Skin cancer is preventable, and melanoma, if caught early, can be cured. Politics in general and jobs that don't pay enough 40 hour work weeks. Books full of boring stuff, schools that should teach, but kids don't learn a thing. These are a few of my least favorite things. Healthcare that won't heal and how people treat the earth. Paying tolls and taxes, disbelief in self worth, bitter cold winters that cut into spring. These are a few of my least favorite things. Religions that claim they're true, don't get me started. Standards that double and people cold hearted. Judgment and bias when freedom don't ring. These are a few of my least favorite things. All the lying, all the killing, when I'm depressed and sad. I add that to all of my least favorite things, and then I feel really bad. <laughs> I feel like Julie Andrews or something. 